All right, I'm recording. So anything you say can be used against you in the court of YouTube. You really want to know who Superman is? <laughs> Watch this. What is going on, guys? It is Brian with Superman's Comics, back with another episode of that Simple Man's Comics and Fred podcast. Special guest tonight. He's been on this channel before. He's also a Patreon member of Simple Man's Comics. And if you haven't seen him on this channel, you've probably seen him on some other comic book YouTube channel because he is on every channel, but he also has his own. And we are talking about Comic Man. Andy, how's it going, buddy? Dude, it's going well. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for the chance to hang out and talk comic books tonight. Yeah, we've... um so we were supposed to start recording like an hour ago, but Andy and I have just been sitting here having a conversation. Almost forgot about we had to record. So <laughs> great time. We, we we text a lot back and forth, Instagram. So let the viewers know what's the name of your channel and then where else they can find you on social media. Hey, my channel name is simply just Comic Man Andy. You guys can find me there twice a week. You guys can find me on the Comic Core YouTube channel twice a week as well. And if you are on any of the social media platforms, just hit that at symbol and search Comic Man Andy. You can find me on Instagram. You can find me on IG on the regular. So we will also have links in the description of this video to his YouTube channel and his other social. So if you want to follow him on there, make sure you check out those links. But so if this was someone's first time seeing you on this on youtube or on video at, at all they could take one look behind you and see that you're a huge punisher fan how did you become a punisher fan and where did your love for punisher begin dude uh man long time ago back in the 80s as a kid you know you're yay tall working chores trying to wow your parents and be a good child right and whenever you're out shopping with the family it's like you kind of get a little treat right we happened to be going through a drugstore back in the day as a kid. And my mother was like, well, hey, you know, pick out something that interests you. You you did good this week or whatever, whether it was school or something. I can't even remember. At that drugstore, they have the old school spinner rack of comic books. That spinner rack happened to have, I think it was 1988, 1987. I think it was 1988. Punisher All the good War old Journal days. One. Yeah. Punisher War Journal number one was in that rack. It was the first comic book I ever bought as a kid and to this day that's one of the books that's one of those covers that i'll always always cherish i think it's carl potts cover jim lee pencils um and i'll always cherish that book and i pull it out of every bin no man i'd probably have half a short box of that book now just that one single book that's how it kind of started for me reading that book and reading war journal i kind of got hooked as a kid i kept reading war journal and it just expanded from there and then when you learn the origin and the story of the punisher you kind of I was kind of a little torn, but when I learned that he was a Marine or had been in the Marine Corps, I kind of dug deeper into that. Eventually, I myself became a Marine as well. Because of Punisher? I don't know about because, but that seed was definitely planted. And it's funny because the, that story that you presented right there is a story that a lot of us have, especially from that time period of getting into comics or buying stuff. And I think about nowadays the way the prices of comics are they'd be like pick something out and the kid brings like a single comic book issue up and the parents like hell no i'm not spending 3.99 4.99 do you want to eat or do you want a comic book the prices of comic books nowadays are like freaking outrageous and i always wonder we got into that hobby for, you know collecting trading cards comic books a lot of those things that have carried over to having that disposable income at the age we are now to where we can continue that collection but how do you get kids into the hobby now thank god for free comic book day thank god for halloween fest but the price of comic books now it's like i don't know how you bring them in to where is there like an allowance still or you know they're always i don't see too many kids in the comic book store like when we were kids yeah no you're right and where's the old bike racks full of bikes with kids getting there and whatnot. I will say that LCS is at least mine. Some of them are doing really good jobs with keeping kids sections for books that are just for kids. And the manager and the owner will never ever stop a kid from sitting down on that floor and reading a book and putting it back. You know what I mean? They always welcome kids in there all the time. And us as parents have to foster it to some degree as well. And it just seems like a natural stepping stone when the, when my LCS offers those, those little golden books, Yep. And they have the kids section of comic books that are comic books, but they're geared more towards a much younger audience. It just seems like a really good natural progression in the reading stages as children grow up. 
Yeah, I just wish my LCS would stop putting them next to the Funkos and the plushies <laughs> and the like $15 mystery box of trash because Marketing. I'm like, pick out a comic book. And they're like, can I get this $30 Mario plushie? That's <laughs> I'm like, no, pick out a comic book. And yeah. then they reach for the plushie anyways. And then they hit the shelf and that wire rack falls down and all the comic book falls. That may or may not have happened at my LCS. <laughs> but um, yes, my youngest has been heavy on Miles Morales. So when I took them uh, last week to the comic book store, I asked them, I was like, hey, do you want to get a Miles comic book? And I actually picked up the le- the latest single issue. But then when we went to the checkout, like you said, the kids at ages books is right up there. And they had the, um, not like a trade, but it was almost like an all ages uh, Miles Morales collected issues of, hey, get to know Miles Morales type thing. So he ended up picking that up. And my kid, he, first grade, they... If, if they're in grade school, at least where I am at, they have to do reading steps, uh, 15 minutes per step, and they have to read like four steps per day. So he's been reading that over and over, getting his steps knocked out, and then he runs downstairs to play Miles Morales on PlayStation. But <laughs> Yeah. And then he, when we go in my truck to go get dinner or run any other errand, guess what we have to listen to? The Miles Morales video game soundtrack. Better than Blippy, I'll tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when the, the the Miles Morales animated movie came out, we listened to that soundtrack forever too. But at least that had like Lil Wayne and stuff on it. This is just like the, the I won't say I say John Williams, but John Williams didn't compose it, but the whole cinematic soundtrack. And he's telling me at this part, he's like, this is the mission where you got to do this. And then you got to like take a picture of a buoy. And I'm like, good Lord, this kid's played this game too much but i like it also because it's gotten him into comic books more he's a huge marvel cinematic universe fan now he watches like when i'm not even paying attention he's up there watching disney plus and he's like watching not, not the favorite movies like his favorite i think mcu movie was guardians of the galaxy but now it tends to be iron man 3 and i don't know who many, too many people would say iron man 3 is their favorite mcu movie Right. <laughs> I mean, I was like, I remember seeing that in the theater going, hmm, hmm, <laughs> for a new one. <laughs> but so, I, in addition to Punisher, I also know you as a big Saga fan. And anytime, like, I had Saga on the three down not too long ago, and I've got instantly text messages, DMs. <laughs> <laughs> like you know like i'd like yeah, robbed right. your bank account well, i don't even say robbed your bank account but basically like i robbed your puppy and i was like well hold on man i was like a lot of times we put them on the down we do it for a buying opportunity type thing and i think saga is right with that but just that hiatus you know whenever there's a hiatus in a book you've seen it with any of these books we saw it with monstrous you've seen it with walking dead especially with these image books just kind of that dip in attention span but no doubt saga is a great blue chip especially within the modern comic book community but how are you such a huge fan of saga Oof, this is kind of a lengthy story and it's a little bit deeper level story as well your story about saga is a saga (laughs) yeah a bit um so a number of years ago i mean we all understand expectations of of life and growing up and whatnot and what your family's expectations are and what society's expectations are and where you live around the world you get to a point where you look for that significant other and you get married and you want to start a family and get a house with the fence and all this other cool stuff and a dog and whatnot but eventually some wrenches get thrown out there and uh, we were eventually delivered the news that we could we could never have kids that's a really tough pill to swallow your family, her family, everybody's families are staring at you. Like ah, every time you get together at a family get together and pinching the cheeks, when are you <laughs> going to have them? <laughs> That's exactly it. You know, grand, the potential grandmothers are asking, Hey, when's this going to happen? When are, when are we going to see some grandkids? And it's like, you want me to sit here and tell you how often I'm stooping your daughter or something like that? I mean, just be like, I enjoy the practice. <laughs> it's like it's not for the lack of trying trust me that's a very tough pill to swallow with the with what society's expectations are of people in the world today especially when you think everything's going to be just fine 
lo and behold, when we were given that information, we sat down and came up with another five-year plan for ourselves. What are we going to do as a couple and as a unit uh, for the rest of our lives, or for at least the next five years? We came up with a plan starting off. We're going to get back in our own hobbies, right? Back in this, I wanted to get back into video gaming. I want to get back into comic books and all this other stuff. So I waltz right into my LCS that same week. A few days later, it's like, hey, I've been out of the game for a couple of years, sold off my old personal collection a while ago. And I want to get back into a regular pull list. What have I missed out over the last number of years? Yeah. What's the first What are these I things have? called variants? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what are variants? First book they point me to was Saga. They said, this is the first thing you have to read to get current on indie books. So I told them, I said, I'm a big sci-fi fan and I'm a big indie fan. Um, and I'm a big Punisher fan and some of this other stuff. They said, go right towards Saga, pick that up introductory price grab it you'll be back for more well anybody that's read saga knows the first couple of pages are essentially a child being born that's an even tougher pill to swallow and you feel like the universe is just taking a giant crap on you and i took that book and threw it right across the room and said how am i gonna do now saga! Ah! <laughs> yeah and it, it, i just kind of lost it i kind of sat down and i'm like really i'm like not only am i down but i'm gonna get kicked while i'm down and then i'm gonna be rolled off a cliff and i think it was not even two weeks after that not even maybe 10 days we found out we were pregnant that's true it's not her it's a we because you it's feel a, the pains too it's excuse me like like this is for real this is gonna happen we are gonna have a child and it was for real like the, we were at after just being told we could never had kids after trying for many years. Now, and then not only that, but you had the best excuse ever to get back into comics. Cause that's the one I used is, Hey, this is going to pay for this kid's college one day. So I just wanted something to do to bide my time and <laughs> try to figure out what our next move was. And then that first thing they had me grab was saga and that first two pages, a child being born. And after everything we had been through, I'm like, how could this be happening and, and just how can you get kicked hard like that when you're already down and then 10 or so days, maybe two weeks to 10 days, we found out we were pregnant. So from the discussion so far, we see obviously that you're a huge, passionate comic book collector. How did that parlay you over into wanting to start your own YouTube channel? How's that journey been for you? And where do you see your YouTube channel going in the future? Ooh. <laughs> it's pretty interesting thinking about comic books and talking about comic books, you kind of yearn for a larger group of people to talk with because the local comic shop, you know, you're in, you're out. Most people don't really sit there and hang out and talk comic books and then start Google searching a little bit. And you realize that there's a whole larger community on YouTube and you start watching people. You start finding content that you like, you start talking in the chat and you're like, this is great. Well then there are some giveaways and there's some other interactivity inter activities that you can interact with, with other channels. And eventually people are like, get out there, start doing it. I owe Drew Manchu from the comic core and I owe bear Island for the real big push to start my channel. And it was a hilariously uh, fun time talking with them. It was bear islands Royal guard contest. I wanted to make an entry into that to do a video for to get in and I just sat down and tried to do it and tried to do it. And I spent about a week of constantly recording and deleting stuff. And every day, Drew Manchu from the Comic Corps is like, Andy, just do it. Just record it. Stop worrying about what it's going to look like. Record it, do it, put it up, and be done with it. And I owe those two guys for the big push to start and do my first video on my channel. And then the rest of the community and all the content that everybody has going on just continues to push other people to grow and be better. So that was a ton of fun. And then you kind of find your own path from there and you ebb and flow with everything else that's going on. And right now, currently I'm doing like two shows a week. So it's my Monday mail call, cause I'm always going to be buying stuff. So it just seemed like a natural thing to sit down and hang out with people and show how good or how bad packaging can be, how amazing Brian from Simpleman's comics packaging is every month. And, you know, <laughs> and fun stuff like that. So that seemed like a natural thing to do on my time off. But then new comic book day, new comic book day is something I really enjoy. And it's, I'm lucky enough that my comic book shop opens up first thing in the morning. I can grab my books. I can come home and I can read for about an hour and a half and just hit go live for 20 minutes. And it's not about what I think people should be buying or people should be putting their money into. It's what, what I enjoy, what I thought was good. And it's like, Hey, if you're a fan of this, I think you might like this. 
And I really enjoy having that 10, 15, 20 minute platform to share my thoughts on some books. And there are actually a lot of people that watch that on Wednesday. And I'm really thankful for the people that have been coming by the subscriber base. Like that. I'm not too, not concerned about like major, major goals on the subscriber base, but it would be nice that if at some point I do hit that thousand mark and hit that monetization mark that whatever little bit trickles in, I'd like to actually take that and work to find a way to donate that money into causes like the till till Valhalla project, the t-shirt that I have four or five of these t-shirts. I'm constantly wearing about ending veteran suicide, things of that nature. Brad, one of the people that we, you and I have talked with the uh, crossroads therapy farms runs uh, a thing for veterans, something like that. Cause at the end of the day, what comes in as far as like channel monetization stuff probably isn't a lot, but it's money that can be used for good causes. And then I'm hoping to be able to do that at some point. Yeah, it's great. Cause you mentioned some great uh, charities there as well. And it, those are two that strike home to us. They support veterans and you and I are both veterans of the only branch of service that really matters, right? United States Marine Corps. We rock. It's number five. But yeah, and you know, it's just keep having fun and doing fun things because that's what it's all about. At the end of the day, it's they're comic books. They're just comic books. They're funny books. Let's have fun with them. And it's nice to have this extension and sit down and have a group of people coming over to my channel and then us going over to their channels because the channels are always going to be as unique as the people running them. Therefore, different tastes, different ideas, different aspects. There are so many books that I've found and I've read that I've fallen in love with that I never would have known if it wasn't for people in this community. You know what I mean? And the content that they're sharing and the discussions they're having. Yeah. And it's always great to find out what other people like that you might not have been aware of before. Absolutely. Now, are you a, a, a floppy reader or do you buy the floppies, protect it for the collection and then wait and buy it in trade or read it digitally? Or do you actually like buy the books, read it, try to keep it pristine and then protect it? I, unfortunately, I'm an amalgamation of everything <laughs> now. Literally everything. I have floppy copies of everything for the collection. And I'm still that 90s kid still in me. I buy two of everything pretty much. New comic like that Wednesdays. I live I sketch for the Star Wars figures. I buy three. One to play with, one to collect, and one to sell. I have three of each. One to display, one to open, and one just in case. Awesome! Yeah, uh, pretty much. New Comic Book Day Wednesdays, I've curtailed my spending a lot, and I don't buy two of everything on, on New Comic Book Day Wednesdays. But uh, anything that I'm collecting that I'm kind of a completionist collector on, I'm getting like two of everything. Stuff that I feel is extremely undervalued. Like when we were doing the hot cold stuff together on your channel and uh, some of the CBSI guys were some of that stuff that we felt really good about. I wanted in my collection. I was buying two, three copies of stuff. So I'm reading floppy copies more often than I think I am. But what I do a lot of now is I read a massive amount of digital books to keep up with the reading that I'm doing with the comic core and with a lot of other friends uh, JP Budget Collects, we do some indie reads on there um, with John's Comics with Kids and uh, some of the other groups and people. Well, it's just incredibly unfeasible to sit and try to buy all these books and have them shipped in in time because you're not going to find them locally a lot of the times. So buying and collecting and holding on to the floppy copies, doing the digital stuff, the trades, I'll definitely buy and collect trades. And I'm actually probably slowly moving away from trades into omnibuses and hardcovers yeah because I, I love trade paperbacks I, I i don't i think they get a a little bit of a bad rap just because they're not the sexy things because they're not the ones that bring big money there are some trades that bring some big money don't get me wrong but i as a reader like reading it in those chunks those volumes um I like that thing that Scout was doing with their, hey, they put out a number one, but that you can, you can get the rest of it in a trade. But when you're digesting stories like that, I do love trades. I find myself like you where I end up buying the whole thing where I'm like, I buy the floppies. I read it digitally though, but then I buy the trade and reread it in the trade. But then when the whole collected version comes out in an omnibus, I end up buying the omnibus. Well, I'm starting to find out. To, um, donate the trades to like... Uh, the local library here or schools um, stuff like that, just because, Hey, I have the full collection now. And, and then the trades, especially libraries and then sc school's a great place to donate some of those too, as well. 
Does not saga. Yeah. So I'm starting to find out though that trades, a lot of my favorite trades that I'm reading and rereading and rereading, like Walking Dead from the beginning, I was buying the trades, uh, the floppies, and then getting the trades. A lot of those trades, those first 10 or so trades, are starting to fall apart. And yeah. I'm like, oh, that kind of bites because I read them so often. So I'm like, well, that's kind of one of the things that's pushing me towards collected editions or omnibuses or hardcovers is hopefully you you don't eventually have a book that's literally just falling apart. Yeah. There's some Marvel omnibuses that I like that too. Like the binding wasn't the best. Um, like that Walt Simonson Thor omnibus. I wanted that so bad I bought it. And then like shortly after it's like the binding wasn't that great on it. Maybe it was just the one that I got. Who knows? Maybe I got it from wish.com. I don't know. But so we did, you kind of touched on it just now, but as a collector, do you find yourself um, more of a big two? Do you like indies? I, I know you kind of, just like me, like I have some favorites in the big two. Like my favorite is Thor and then Green Lantern. They aren't, again, they aren't the sexiest characters, but they're my favorite characters. But I tend to be more of an indie comics reader. I like indie comics now more than the superhero stories. And you're starting to see some of the big two have stories that kind of lend themselves to that outside the superhero. But like, if you have your pool list, does it consist mostly of indies, big two, or is it kind of spread like diverse? Ooh, my pool list is going to be incredibly indie heavy now. Um, discovering Marvel as a child, I read a lot of Marvel books. But then when you get your first job and your first set of wheels and you discover your local comic shop and you realize, well, I can have a pull list. I can pick up comic books every week. That was when Image was first coming out and Image was getting big and Top Cow and Image and, you know, J. Scott Campbell with those sexy covers and those awesome Michael Turner covers. I completely flip-flopped and was buying like all indie books um, as a young adult, if you will, and collecting those. And then now I find myself still indie heavy on my polls, but I'm definitely a Marvel reader too. I'm reading pretty much most of Donnie Kate stuff, Venom and Thor right now, obviously that's been pretty big. The Al Ewing um, guardians of the galaxies was fun. Kate's run of guardians of the galaxy before that was pretty fun. It ebbs and flows. I find myself answering this question a lot of times where um, it's not so much about the big two or indies. It's about the creative teams that I'm starting to follow David and drew right yes david Brewer, that Drew's creative team i'm awesome. gonna i'm gonna yep uh no matter if they're at if they went to marvel if they went to dc that's a creative team that i'd follow all the time and there's many other ones out there that i have a i have a short list of creators that i buy everything from but if i see them on stuff and i reference that list i just start ordering everything out of the previews magazine because their their content what they're able to do together has just been so such a wow factor for me Gideon Falls with Lemire and Sorrent Sorrento, I think it was. Sorrentino. That right there just knocked Sorrentino. Okay, thanks. That just knocked my socks off. That's a creative team I'm gonna follow as well. I'll it's definitely like keep the old Donny Cates, Cates Jeff stuff. Shaw team. Yeah. Just like so um, it's less about Ed Brubaker, Sean Phillips. Right. It's less about who is backing the books or who's putting the books out so much as it is who's creating them. Do you ever do you ever find yourself running out of supply for your Monday mail call or is your hobby just that exciting where you always got it coming in? Occasionally. Yes. Occasionally. Yes. And our current world situation, when people had more time at home to a degree, the secondary market and what's available, you'd be surprised at how fast some stuff dried up. Punisher stuff for a while there dried up. Not only did it dry up, but with the recent controversy that's been going on with Punisher and the image and just the character, Punisher stuff has tripled in price to the point where I'm not paying that price. I know what that book should cost and I want to pay that price and I'm getting old and stubborn about it and cranky and get off my lawn. I want that Punisher book for 20 bucks, not 75, but <laughs> I digress. <laughs> where are we going with this? A little salty there. I am a little salty. Gosh, darn I, kids. I, I get it though. Like it, just the collective markets, the secondary collective markets, you've seen it firsthand. You and I have seen it firsthand with sports cards, Pokemon cards, magic cards were pricey for a while there. This was a slow climb. Uh, just collectibles in general, people are seeing as a legitimate source for funding retirements or other ways to hide, not hide cash, but 
put money aside. It's not just that, you know, here's your 401k, here's your retirement account, but the days are gone. Days are long gone of people working a career at a company and receiving a pension and getting out. People have to save for their retirements now and they have to create their livelihood after they're done working. And collectibles are a legitimate market now when it comes to taking that money and diversifying a portfolio is the phrase I'm trying to think of is the vernacular I'm looking for. You're really trying to diversify because you look at golden age and you look at silver age stuff and where that's gone. You look at pre-code horror. Pfft. Are we going to see anything? Are we going to see a plateau? Are we going to see a bubble? Who knows? But this stuff just, you look at the last 10, 15, 20 years and it's hard to it's hard to think it's not bulletproof. I mean, it's not bulletproof. Don't get me wrong. It is not bulletproof. But for cripes almighty, look at ASM 129. It, it ebbs and flows, but has it ever gone down? Not massively by any means. Yeah. I'm not too familiar with ASM 129, but. Come on. <laughs> Actually, the great thing about that was I was there when you got it. Yeah. There's a oh, video on the show. That was an awesome weekend. Um, I was so tired that weekend. Yeah, it was awesome. And it's, I mean, it's the trend. You'll see it. Like we always talk about, um, we say spec cycle, but it's just comics in general where the, you know, the popularity, you've seen it where, and lots of circles, right? Fashion trends that come back around. You know, same thing with comics. Um, like you said, pre-code horror stays constant, but I think as those prices of a lot of stuff escalates, they next thing they do is okay what is obtainable for me and then those prices start going up and i still think there's a lot of great stuff in in bronze age especially with those dc horror books i think there's oh, a yeah. lot of uh, undervalued books there which i mean bernie wrightson's freaking phenomenal i mean i buy stuff for his art alone so well this is this is a hot this is a hot topic i'll share with you hot topic not even really a hot topic this is a hot point that i want to share with you that we actually talked about a number of years ago and doing the hot cold videos and working with CBS, CBSI guys is there was something I stumbled on thinking about and the feedback was kind of mixed, kind of 50, 50, but there's a generational aspect to collecting, right? That generational aspect also comes with the monetary monetarily or monetary value, so to speak, where people get priced out of gold. They went to silver. People get are getting priced out of silver. They're going other places same thing, whether it's first appearances or whether it's an age of a comic book or it's a run or a series of comic books, when things get priced out of other people's aspect or their collection buying habits, they're going to be moving somewhere else. You got to skate where the puck is not. So this generational aspect really is a thing. And it's how do you stay ahead of that? And how do you, how do you pay attention to that? And you're seeing that progression over the last 20 years. So now I would love the fact when everybody talked about 90s books are never going to be worth anything. 90s books are going to be terrible garbage. No, there are 90s books out there that are starting to become worth a lot more than people ever thought they would be. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it often depends on what books you're talking about because there's some true. 90s books out there that just get because they're a collector. Um, those are the books that I'm not betting on putting my kids through school for. Yeah, but. no, no, no. Don't get me wrong on that. But look at the Michael Turner stuff after yeah. uh, the unfortunate, pass, unfortunate passing of, of Michael Turner. And when I was buying all of those books and all those Dynamic Forces variants, that was never on my mind. Yeah, and there's really- always outliers out there that buck trends. I mean, uh, uh, Amazing Spider-Man 300 is one that always def- defies me. We're talking about... You always hear people talk about supply and demand. And I mean, how many nine eights or CGC graded books of that alone Thousands. are there out there, but yet people are still paying the money they are. Yeah. It's the highest graded book on the CGC census, not highest grade. It's the highest number of copies graded on the CGC census. And yet that book still pushes new boundaries every month. It seems like. Yes. And the, I'm not trying to create controversy, but it's amazing the differential between 299 and 300 even 298 know, right and 299 and and 298 and 299 are mostly white covers too yeah. much more difficult to get in higher grade than uh, i don't know 300 had some cutting issues that's a whole nother topic for a whole nother show 299 and 298 are definitely incredibly difficult to get in high grade now because of just the, getting those covers dirty and trying to keep them clean and yet you're you hit the nail on the head man there's a very vast difference in price and i wonder because we're starting to see now 
trading cards, especially those 90 Marvel trading cards, are starting to catch up in price too. The trading cards are going nuts right now. Sports trading cards, talked about this recently on 3Up, 3Down. Um, I, I still think Mar the comic book trading card market is really undervalued and can catch up a lot. But we're seeing now those 90s Marvel that are catching a lot of value and people are looking at them. And I wonder if that's going to trickle back into the comics again, because if you look on a lot of back of those cards, it will say the character and it'll say first appearance. Yeah. It's not the first appearance that the market, we always talk about, Hey, what's the true first? What's the market first? I wonder if that's going to bring heat on some of these other books, because some of them mention books that people aren't used to being the first appearance. Well, we're seeing a little bit of that even right now crop up a little more with ASM 135 and 134. That debate has cropped up several times over the years, but it's become a little bit more heated now where 134 has always been considered um, just a cameo of Frank Castle or cameo of the Punisher. And 135 has always been markets considered that to be his second appearance. Sounds like that debate's heating up again. Buy what you like, but with some of that, buy what you can afford because some of the prices are going nuts. Yeah. Uh, tell me about it. It's just, uh, I've been putting together my 2021 hunt list, my 2021 goals list for my channel. And already I keep kind of like, it is right now as we're recording, it is the 9th of February and I still haven't released my videos on those because I keep feeling, I feel like I keep going back and looking at my hunt list or my goals. And it's like, I need to readjust these a little bit. This comic is out of my ballpark now and, or this or that things are changing so fast. I got to sit down and just do these lists and, and commit to them and get these videos out because I really want to see these videos come to fruition and enjoy it and share it with the community. But look at ASM 135 I mean, when I first started thinking about picking up that book, it was well under a grand. Now that book, I think the, I think the one I was watching on eBay, was like close to three grand as a nine, eight. And it's probably going to get closer to five grand. It's going to be somewhere between four and five grand is where it's going to finish probably. For an yeah, it's funny because you follow stuff like that. And it's it, what's great also is there comes to a certain point where sometimes like, all right, screw that. That book's out of my reach right now. But then you do like, I don't know, research or, or whatever, and you pivot to something else and you end up finding some other book that you may or may not have picked up otherwise and are just as happy with it. And you might have also caught it before it, it's got that upward spike, just like you were talking about with those other books. It's just a natural feeling where, it's almost like you always want what you don't have. So Did it's always great the thrill of the hunt of like hunting a grail book. And then once you get it, you're like, okay, what's next? Like when I completed my Did Marvel Did you just call Star, FOMO natural? Come on. Yeah. When I completed my Marvel 9-8 Marvel Star Masters of the Universe run, I was so excited because it was like a span of three or four years. And then when I finally got that last one, which was actually issue number six was the hardest one for me to get. And once I got that and completed issues one through 13 and nine, eight, I was getting comments. What's next? Are you going to collect this? Are you going to collect that? And I was like, I felt like Forrest Gump. I was like, I think I'll go home now. I was just like, I don't know. <laughs> to this point, I still haven't like, like there's a grail and I've talked about before. I want the Walt Disney comics and stories number one. Right. But I mean, a two O like a two O graded copy in that it's like three grand, but um, I don't have a, Hey, I'm hunting for this right now. I'm just kind of laid back. And then as I see stuff, I've been that like spontaneous buyer. I'm like, hmm, Fraggle Rock number 12. I'll get that for 80 bucks. <laughs> so, you know, buy stupid crap, but I don't have a hunt list going on. I, I just, real quick before we wrap up, I kind of talked about this with Steve. And this is what I like doing is having other YouTubers on because I think it's great to get different perspectives. Um, just like I kind of talked to Steve from Burke Family 54, with you and your YouTube channel, if you could offer, let's say, one lessons learned for someone that wants, like, hey, I kind of want to start a YouTube channel. I want to talk about comic books. Um, I want to, you know, I, I want to talk about my passion just the way the same, the same way that these guys are talking about theirs. If you could offer, say, a lesson learned, I won't say word of advice because everyone wants to speak advice, but everyone's done something that they would do differently within their YouTube journey. If you had one thing to tell, one thing to tell someone, what would it be? God, get in and do it. Stop worrying about the details. Plug in the equipment, hit record, or hit go live, and just try. Until you put yourself in the position of trying and learning and troubleshooting and figuring things out, 
the people that are there to support you will be there to support you and they'll give you a quality feedback. They'll give you good information. So just sit down and do it. Stop worrying about the aspects. Stop worrying about the details. Sit down and do it. Quality people will come and hang out with you and they're going to give you the feedback that you need to, to better yourself. Because if you don't try and fail and falter and then learn how to get back up and then try again, that progression, that's that, that progression of trying and failing is really what's going to get you up and running. And then you'll realize what you want to do and how you want to hone it, how you want to craft it. And the next thing you know, while you're doing your stuff and your content and you're hanging out and doing your videos, you're finding out that you're trying and failing, but you're doing it gracefully without even thinking about it or being emotional about it or reacting to it. And you're like, okay, that didn't work out. Let me try something different. It becomes natural and it'll, you'll feel really comfortable. Let go of the stage fright, let go of the fear of anything and just get out and just do it. Yes. I mean, and, and you're, you're going to be your worst critic because you want, you want everything to be perfection. Um, and just do it. And, and I'll let you know also is there might be some like natural stage fright-ish or what, uh, what might people think. I, I'm telling you, when you start doing videos and when you start be, you know, talking to other people in the community, you'll find that the support outweighs the negativity nine times out of 10. Absolutely. I know I just said this, but now for real, before I let you go, I got a question. I thought this would be kind of fun. <laughs> Might be kind of loopy and people like W whiskey tango foxtrot. Um, it's code. <laughs> Have you have you ever watched the movie Cool World back in the day? That old '90s movie with Brad Pitt. If I did, it was so long ago I don't remember it. It's that mixed. It's like those, some of those other movies where it's mixed live action with animation. But yeah, uh, which oh, oh yeah yeah, me, which always got me thinking. You know, let's just say let's take away our own realities right now. And if you were living in an animated movie or an animated world you don't have a wife or anything like that who would your animated wife be and it doesn't have to be cartoon animation it could be comic books because we we like all types of art here but who would your animated comic book wife be lola bunny from space jam <laughs> was i too quick with that <laughs> no <laughs> got me worried there <laughs> worried are you gonna pull up like show me your Lola Bunny tattoo right now? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I, I mean, think you could, go with, you could go with the obvious Jessica Rabbit and the obvious some of the other stuff that people would come up with, but uh, that's what I'll go with Lola Bunny. You know, like Jessica Rabbit does come to mind, and that's one that I think a lot of people would come to mind. But if I were to pick, you know, I'm a big Disney fan, and I'll say being a big Disney fan. Do you think you could guess who mine would be? I don't think you will. No, I probably wouldn't. There's so many great Disney characters out there that I probably would never guess it. Mine would be Meg from Hercules. Oh, okay. <laughs> and there's like plenty of, or you could just have a harem and pick like any female character from his own scope book. Or dynamite book. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But Andy, I do want to say thanks for coming on here. Really appreciate it. And you guys watching right now, make sure you guys check out the description. Check out Comic Man Andy on YouTube and also the links to all his other social media is in the description as well. You get the last word, Andy. Ooh, do I really? Uh, go peace out. Go pinkies out. We're going to catch you all on the flip side for the next video. Stay tuned. I know.